Architecture School is back for you new students and for you returning students. Today in this video, I thought I'd just answer some questions about going back into architecture school, some general kind of questions about architecture school to give you some kind of preparation or just some things to consider. <laughs> You guys have all asked me some great questions over on Instagram. So yeah, without further ado, let's dive into it. What do you think are the key strengths of a good project and how to achieve that? I think one thing that is ten, tends to be overlooked by students in architecture, but is absolutely crucial is narratives. Create a project narrative and run that narrative through everything that you do in that project. That is probably, I think, the best way to communicate a project, the best way to create a design logic, a design process, and through everything that you do for your research, through your design iterations, through your design process, through um, your precedent analysis, through your site analysis, through to all the way through to your building and the communication of your building. If you have a really strong narrative that runs all the way through, that's backed up by research and you can explain exactly why you've done that and why you've made that decision and done this, then that makes a really, really strong project that I think is very difficult to question. And of course, it's important to execute a building really well and communicate it really well through lots of different types of drawings, through plans, sections, elevations, visuals, conceptual drawings, diagrams, all of these kinds of things, they're obviously important, but they only make sense if it fits within a project narrative. If the graphic communication is consistent, all of those things that really embed the narrative and emphasize the story of the project and what the, the project is about, I think you will make a really successful project if you really focus on narrative. How to not get caught up in the toxic aspects of architecture? Very good question. And I mean, if you guys noticed, I made a video a couple of weeks ago about uh, basically asking the question, should you study architecture? Because I talk about the, the all-nighter culture, the ridiculous working hours, uh, the kind of quite unhealthy and not very sustainable culture, lifestyle culture that is pushed to architecture school, the pressure from tutors, critiques, all of that, it can get very toxic. And it's a very good question because some people do get sucked into it and really kind of, they get in, involved in the all night culture. They, they relish the kind of culture of architecture. They want to be a part of a community. And so they kind of continue the, the, the culture that is kind of prevalent at architecture school. However, to break that cycle, I personally think as an individual and as a friendship group, if you've got a group of friends, I think a really important thing is just to encourage a healthy and balanced and just a positive lifestyle that isn't all about architecture. And I feel like it's really important to implement just some healthy routines and healthy um, habits where you're going to do your hobbies, you're not working all the time, you're getting to sleep earlier at night you're not kind of getting involved in the all-nighter culture. Um, you're looking after yourself, you're going to the gym, you're doing walks once a day, you're seeing your family once a week, you're seeing your friends maybe twice a week, and making sure that you really encourage and push and make sure that you do these positive things. That's how we're gonna break out of the toxic culture in architecture, is by making a change. You guys as students, we as individuals, can make a change by simply being healthier and, and, and saying, no, I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna work all night. I'm gonna do this in my own time. I'm gonna manage my time. I'm gonna be organized. I'm gonna schedule what needs to be done. And that's the way that I wanna do it. And I feel like that is the approach I feel like you need to take if you don't wanna get immersed in the toxic culture. How can you improve your public speaking skills? This is something that I personally was asking myself or asking other people a couple of years ago and I still do now. It is the one thing that we always dread in architecture school, going into a final crit or a presentation or an external examiner visit um, or just any kind of presentation is just the worst thing ever. And that's how I used to think. Um, however, it did slightly change when I went into my masters and I got more comfortable with presenting and I'll tell you how I did that. So during my undergraduate, I was just highly, highly anxious, stressed, worried about what the outcome was gonna be out of the presentation, whether I was gonna embarrass myself, where I was gonna stutter, where I was gonna, if I was gonna freeze, if I was just gonna get all hot, red and sweaty, because I tend to get hot and red when I present. And obviously I was just too bothered about what people thought of me and I was too, well, I cared too much about how the presentation was gonna go and whether it was gonna be perfect or not, whether I was gonna say everything perfectly and communicate everything perfectly. But when I started to become more confident 
and better at communicating was when I started to take away that pressure off myself. When I started to think, actually, you know what, what would be what would be and what, how I'll go into this presentation. If I stutter, it doesn't matter. People don't care. Everyone stutters in a presentation. If I don't say everything perfectly, it doesn't matter. It, it really isn't a big deal because I feel like there's always that, that feeling that everything needs to be perfect. Everything needs to be communicated. I need to say everything, but sometimes you don't, especially if you have the confidence in your work and the work up on the wall, it doesn't all have to be perfect in the way that you speak. So one thing that I think took the pressure off me was just making sure that I have the drawings that I am proud of, that I am confident with. I'm happy with the work that I produce. And often the worst presentations that I've done is projects where I'm not proud of, is projects that I'm not happy with, I, I can't really buy into myself, so it's gonna be impossible for me to sell it to someone else. So make sure that you just are really passionate about your work, really confident in what you do. And you'll notice that when you present, that will ooze through in your presentation. One thing that I find is a really useful uh, trick, it's just rehearsing what you're going to say. And I mean, that sounds really straightforward and obvious, but it, but it is. <laughs> Maybe the night before you present, just read through, make some notes about what you want to say. Maybe go through your presentation, um, make some bullet points, or if you're someone who really likes to script it, do that. I think it's important for people to find the best way that works for them when presenting. Personally, for me, I can't script. I just, it throws me off if I've got a script in front of me and I have to read it. It's just, I don't like doing that. Don't just show up to a crit and just think, I don't really know what to say about this because that is the worst thing you can do. If you show up, you put someone on the wall and you'll be like, yeah, so this is a drawing and I'm not sure quite why I've put this here. Create a narrative, create a story, sell the project, try and just curate a really kind of powerful um, presentation that really tells the story of your project and it's going to communicate it as best as possible to the viewer. All of these things is just how to make sure that you are in there with confidence and that you are kind of passionate and you feel proud of what you do. And I think once you feel proud and you're comfortable with your project, you will fly and you'll notice that come through um, in the presentation. What would make my portfolio stand out? I think when it comes to a portfolio, the graphic communication is vital. It's all about having a consistent, coherent, but also relevant graphic style that runs throughout the project, your portfolio to be able to communicate the narrative of the project. Graphic communication is so important. And I actually recently developed a course that talks about how to build your architecture graphic style. And essentially it covers what architecture graphic communication is and basically how you guys can implement your own graphic style and create your own graphic style to be able to effectively communicate projects. The workshop has five different modules. The first two modules are talking about graphic communication and modules three, four, and five is a step-by-step -step workshop talking about how I take a Rhino model from this to this simply through graphic communication and how I communicate my graphic style through my drawings. I built this course essentially based on my experience in architecture and understanding that although architecture schools expect you to be able to visually communicate your projects, they very rarely teach you the graphic skills on how to and likewise in practice. So I developed this course as something that I kind of wanted to do for a while and been able to help you fellow students on how to communicate your projects. So if this is something that interests you, I'd highly recommend check it out. It's linked down below in the description and I'd highly recommend you check out the course. What is the one thing students can't forget as a new student? Uh, that there is, there is so much to learn. And I mean, I feel like there are a lot of students out there that go into first year, they learn a couple of things and they're like, oh yeah, I'm an expert now. Uh, that's it, I'm done, that's me. I'm an architect, I can do what I want. But no, sadly in architecture, it's a profession that there is so much to learn and you'll never learn everything. That is the beauty of it. I think that what that's what one thing that makes people love architecture so much and that is so powerful is that there is an infinite amount of things to learn and don't hold yourself back from not learning things as well. I think it is a it is a, a trait of students where they feel like, okay, I know this now, this is what I want to do. I'm going to focus on this and I'm not going to learn about that. That's not relevant to what I want to know. Uh, but I think the important thing is just to open your eyes up and just think, okay, I want to learn all different kinds of things because it's all going to help me. It's all going to help me create like a rounded uh, architect and, and someone who can really kind of tap into lots of different things and be able to take information from there, there and there. I like that kind of project for that reason, but I like that one for another reason. And just being able to be open and kind of absorb, be a sponge and absorb information as much as possible and don't kind of shut yourself off to particular things. 
a more particular way of thinking. Any thesis advice, being anxious about how it will turn out. I mean, I can relate massively. I was going into my second year masters, I was the most anxious about my, my dissertation. That is the one thing that I've always struggled with reading and writing. Just simply being able to communicate through writing is just not my thing or hadn't been my thing until I really kind of got into it um, in masters. But I understand why you're anxious because it's a very daunting thing. Architecture is very creative and design based. So then when you're asked to write about something, it's like, okay, I don't really know how to do this because I'm not really kind of massaging that muscle. I'm not working that muscle. Um, but one thing that I would really encourage is write something that you, you think you will really enjoy and that there is a lot to write about. The worst thing to do is to pick something that you don't really enjoy and there's not really much information on it. Because then you're sat there, we're not only thinking, I don't really enjoy doing this, but I also, when I do do it, there's not really much to write about or research. The best thing you can do is to find something, tailor it to your interest, tailor it to something that you really enjoy and that you're passionate about. It might even be something that isn't directly related to architecture. You could tailor it to something to one of your passions that you might have outside of architecture or your passions towards different cultures or different countries or you can tailor it to however you want um, to kind of drive your passions through it but also make sure that there is a really strong body of work and research that you can dive into to make sure that you've got a lot to write about and a lot of points to touch upon what's the workload like during masters like how many days are you in uni etc so there's a difference between how many days you're in university and the workload. It's very different. Obviously, at undergraduate, you spend a lot more time in university because they're teaching you skills. You've got extra lessons about softwares. They're teaching you how to draw. They're teaching you probably all of the basics and the fundamental things about architecture. So you're spending more actual kind of timetable time in university. Masters, you don't necessarily have to be in as much. However, when you're not in university, you're working more on the project so the workload is more um, but to be honest it doesn't actually feel significantly more I felt it was fairly similar and because I was working on things that I really enjoyed and I was really passionate about and I was researching what I wanted to research I was designing what I wanted to design the time that you're putting in doesn't feel anywhere near as much at undergrad when you're kind of feeling like you're forced to do a project or you're not quite comfortable with the brief or the client etc at masters you've got a lot more freedom and independence to search research what you want create projects that you believe in and that you're passionate about which makes that workload kind of more bearable of course um, and obviously at masters level with that independence you have more management over your time you can work pretty much whenever you want um, you will tend to obviously have the kind of set in stone lectures that you need to be there for you've got the the studio days that you are required to be in there for however you only have to be there to speak to your tutor. You don't necessarily have to spend the day there. You could go and speak to your tutor, go home and work in your home environment if that is better for you. Uh, so masters is really about just finding uh, the way that works best for you, how you feel comfortable in working, what kind of environments that you like working in. And it gives you more of a choice and that independence and that freedom to be able to do that and make those decisions on how you want to be able to work. Um, because at undergrad, I feel like it's a little bit more restrictive in that you're encouraged more to stay in the studio, spend more time at the university, whereas masters, you can kind of do what you want because you're adults at the end of the day. And the last question is, what is your main piece of advice for first years? I mean, I'm gonna give maybe two or three pieces of advice here. The first one is just being open to learn. Like I said earlier, that is vital. Don't kind of narrow yourself off and just be open, be a sponge, absorb research, etc. like I've already said. The second one is be as creative as possible. Use your hands don't use a bloody computer because this is, this is going to prevent you this is going to stop you this is going to hinder your creativity and your your growth i would encourage massively to draw improve on your drawing skills being very hands-on with making models testing things out looking at things at scales being able to kind of just pick up a, a cereal box and turn it into a model sketch out certain things draw out all your floor plans your visualizations use pen markers, use collaging, sticking things together, cutting them up. Just be as creative as possible and start flexing those creativity muscles because that's definitely going to help you further down the line. When you then come back to the computer and you're working in Rhino, Revit, wherever the software is, you, at least then you know that you've already 
you've already massaged those creative muscles and you'll be much better at being able to communicate a project and also developing a project because there is one thing developing a project for a computer and there's another being able to develop it through a sketch, through a model, through some visualizations, through then to a computer. That would be a much more fruitful project. And that is gonna be a wrap on today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. I mean, I've spoken really, really quickly to be able to get through those questions as quick as possible. If you enjoyed the video, please smash the thumbs up button, make sure to subscribe, hit the notification bell, and I'll see you next time. Peace.